Hello, 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 hello. Once again, here we are, the LaRueless Cafe. I want to thank all of you who are waiting out there, those who have joined us for the show. As you know, last week we did kick off our Gay Pride Month. So are we all still here? <laughs> Can everyone see us? We are still live. And I have no idea what happened. All right. At least we're all still here. Hello, Facebook friends, YouTube friends. I don't know what the heck happened, but I do know that I wasn't going to cave and, and not um, try to figure it out. So we're still going to open this show. Hi, Luann. Yes, I am back. <laughs> I am back. Um, we have a wonderful show set up for you today. As I was saying, last week we kicked off our Gay Pride Month. And at that time, we talked about the politics of HIV and COVID-19. We had a whole bunch of things planned for you for the next four episodes. But lo and behold, we got a little gift horse yesterday. A very conservative United States Supreme Court did something that shocked all of us, and there was no way that we weren't going to talk about this today. So the name of today's sh uh, show is You Can't Fire Me Because I'm Gay. And it's going to be an amazing show. So forget about the technicalities, the problems we had. Kick your shoes off, sit back, get a cup of tea, get a cup of coffee, get a glass of wine. I drink wine. I may even do gin or something tonight, and I have never had either in my life. But we are going to enjoy ourselves and hear what these amazing guests have to say to us tonight. The first person I'm bringing on is Christian. So Christian Fuscarino, uh, many of you have seen him in the past on the show. We had uh, a great conversation several months ago when we had some hate talk going on in the city of Trenton, and we had to set the record straight for homophobic people who had those types of things to say. Christian, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, I appreciated the many Janines at the start of the show. That uh, <laughs> I see, I think you had about eight of me, right? <laughs> I, I could take eight more. That was wonderful. So uh, thank you for continuing to push on so that we can speak with everybody tuning in tonight. Well, look, thank you for sticking around. I said to my uh, granddaughter, I said, you know, I don't know if my guests are still in the studio because my computer just turned itself off after it said, hello, 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 about 22 times. And she said, I bet you they're there waiting for you, Mimi. And lo and behold, you are. So we're going to bring you back on in a couple of seconds. But again, thank you very, very much for coming on to the show tonight. Thank you for having me. The next person we have, I uh, want her to say hello, is, um, and only um, one hello, is Ariel Adler. Come on on, Ariel. Hi, good evening, Janine. How are you doing? Fine, thanks, and thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Well, I can't wait. You, you, all of you have such fascinating backgrounds. So before we get into the Supreme Court decision, I'm gonna bring you back on so that we can get into you because all three of you have fascinating backgrounds. But thank you, one of our lawyers on the panel today, Ariel, thank you. Looking forward to it. So Celeste, Celeste Gerald, I will not be calling you uh, her, she, hers. You have another pronoun. Tell us about that. I do. And thanks for having me. And I really apologize that my non-binary gender identity and my they pronouns caused an electrical short on this <laughs> program. Um, I will take responsibility for well, that. Well, you are first, you know. Uh, exactly. 
<laughs> exactly. And I hope I'm not the last, even though I caused some sort of electrical disturbance. You are absolutely right that my pronouns are they, them, and theirs, because I am non-binary, meaning that I don't identify um, as a man or a woman or male or female. And um, I am often somebody's first non-binary person. So if there's people who are viewing, you can say, hey, look, I saw a non-binary person who is a lawyer, who's a parent, a business owner, and over the age of 35. So this I is not it. just a youth movement. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I am really very interested in hearing about your background as well. I know you all have unique backgrounds and we want to take this moment to be a learning uh, situation for a lot of my viewers who may not really have much relationship with people who are not in the lifestyle, but who, well, um, I, I know who's going to teach me when he comes back. Christian, he's just waiting to tell me to get rid of that word lifestyle. And I'm going to do that. But we'll bring you back on. Thank you, Celeste. Thank you. So, Christian, Christian, tell me about who you are. So, well, so I am very fortunate to uh, be the leader of Garden State Equality, um, New Jersey's statewide LGBTQ organization. We've got an incredible team of uh, individuals working on items from older adults programs to our health and wellness work, which is more important now than possibly ever with in light of COVID-19. Um, and we are also doing a lot of work in schools from our longstanding anti-bullying program, um, which really came out of the Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights, which was the most comprehensive anti-bullying policy in the nation at the time. It was um, uh, written into law. Shout out to Luann Peter Paul, who is watching and played an important role in that. Um, to, and now today we're you know, still doing that work in schools and focusing a lot on LGBTQ inclusive curriculum. The state of New Jersey is um, the second in the nation to be teaching LGBTQ inclusive curriculum and the first in the country to be teaching it across all relevant subject areas, not just history. So uh, we've been ahead of the curve. And so at a time when the entire nation is celebrating the victory that we had yesterday in the Supreme Court. Uh, here in New Jersey, we too are taking part in that celebration, but coming from a place where we've had these protections um, for uh, over a decade um, and have been in a, a much more fortunate position. We also are um, being conscious that at a time when we need to celebrate something good because it's been a long four years of just chipping away at our rights by the Trump administration. We wanna celebrate something good, but we also recognize the important dialogue that's taking place across our country right now, where we need to question racism at every level uh, of our government, of our state uh, and of our communities. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I welcome the celebration. I welcome the joy that this is bringing into people's lives. And I hope that we can take that energy and stand with our brothers, sisters, and siblings in the black community, um, some of whom who are LGBTQ, and um, keep the momentum going on that important conversation. So you, you mentioned um, about the black community, and I know I want to give a big shout out as well, who's giving you a big shout out is uh, Carolyn Chang. Uh, it's always great to see Carolyn come on uh, to the LaRue She's an amazing attorney and former head of the uh, Association of Black Women Lawyers. So Carolyn, thank you very much. But uh, you're, you're actually in a uh, biracial marriage. You're in a mixed marriage, right? Yeah, I, you know, admittedly, I don't think about it much, but I am in an interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. um, Loving Day just passed, I think it was last week. Uh, yeah. And we took pause to think about the fact that our relationship is only possible because of uh, uh, decades of people fighting for right, our rights. So whether mm -hmm. that's our interracial marriage, whether that is our same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. um, whether that is 
Aaron, my partner, my husband, being able to serve openly in the military. So much of who we are is really because of the sacrifice of previous generations who worked harder so that we could enjoy these rights today. Um, and you know, when you think about the uh, David Mixner posted on social media that leading up to the Supreme Court's decision yesterday, um, this is something that folks in the community have been working on for five decades. This, you know, was a long fought journey. Um, and uh, so there really is a lot of reason to be happy and celebrate. We talk about um, employment discrimination a lot at Garden State Equality, um, especially when speaking to corporations who have employees in other states across the country. And um, folks are always shocked who lived in, live in this New York City, Philadelphia metropolitan area, um, live in this somewhat liberal bubble of New Jersey when we talk about the patchwork of equality across the country and that so many states don't have LGBTQ protections like we do here in New Jersey. And so yesterday's decision is really gonna alter the way that we are talking with companies who have employees in other states. Um, it, it's a, a, a very important step forward. We couldn't be happier. Um, and it's so important. I just wanna share a little bit. I, you know, I love to talk, so cut me off when, when we're ready to move on, but um, we're contacted all the time uh, from folks in New Jersey who are facing discrimination at the workplace because of who they love or how they identify. This is New Jersey. I, I, you know, this, this is one of the most liberal accepting parts of the country where we have an anti-discrimination law on the books and yet discrimination takes place in the workplace. And so, you know, we can talk a little bit about lived equality versus legal equality um, a little bit later, but um, if that's happening here, then what's taking place in the states that don't have those anti-discrimination laws? What's taking place in more conservative, not as accepting states? And I cringe to think about what it's like to be an LGBTQ person open in a workplace where you are not accepted and you have to live in fear of being fired because simply because of who you love um, or how you identify. Um, and while you know individual cases vary here in New Jersey, discrimination still takes place. Like these folks aren't just calling us because they they think that they've been discriminated against. They're they're being demoted and fired and, and many times um, for other reasons. But you know some of the information that's clear based on uh, how the employer is speaking with the employee or the incidences that have taken place, it is because they're LGBTQ uh, or yeah, because they're LGBTQ. It's not in their head. I mean, people think sometimes that maybe I'm a little paranoid, but it's really happening. And, and I am gonna bring Celeste in uh, to talk about uh, from a legal perspective as well. Um, at some point, I'm gonna want all three of you on at the same time, because it is fascinating what this is going to mean to individuals in this state. But as you mentioned, all around this country, there are other people who celebrated a little bit harder than we did in New Jersey, because it's given them some freedom, some real freedom. Absolutely, and they, and they should bask in this moment. It doesn't come uh, often, and this is gonna have uh, a, a big impact on so many states, but also like what it means as we move forward because the, 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 the ruling will have an impact um, uh, far, much more far reaching than just in the workplace because of how they determined, uh, you know, we are gonna recognize what sex means, sex right. and gender means. So let's, let's bring in Celeste right now and let's see what, what she has to, no, what they have to say on this. I'm gonna get it right before the program's over. Now, before I move on to that question, we've gotta give a shout out to Assemblywoman Spate, because she comes on to this program all of the time. And I know you're gonna start a watch party because we want your constituents, Assemblywoman, to also be exposed more to this issue. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming on to the show tonight. Now, I guess, Celeste, your boss won't um, fire you on your job. Tell me about your work situation. <laughs> And you know what's funny? Um, you used my joke, and I did not give you permission. That was not consent. Oh my goodness! So I'm I didn't know you did that. Back. that. <laughs> oh, all the time. 
Um, and you know, it's, you know, I can joke about it now because I'm, you know, a practicing attorney now for 10 years. But when I was in law school, I was told, and this is 10 years ago, I was told that I should grow out my hair, not really come out as non-binary or genderqueer or whatever terms I was using for myself because rather than worry about being fired, I needed to worry about getting hired. Right. And so that, and that is actually something um, that, some incredible work has been done in the state of New Jersey from the uh, Transgender Task Force um, that just recently, and I say recently, it could have been months ago, I'm starting to age um, quicker <laughs> than I want to. Um, they released a report and it showed how um, the experience of lived equality for transgender and non-binary people in New Jersey is vastly different than it is under the law. Um, so I think that, you know, when we are talking, and I and to Christian's point, you know, he touched on this too, is that court decisions like this are wonderful and they're great, but we have to sort of look at what's not being said, but what is being said by the people in our community who live it, which is, we have a hard time finding jobs and being hired, particularly transgender and non-binary people, and tra particularly transgender and non-binary people of color. Transgender women of color have it the toughest when trying to find employment. If it's between, you know, not necessarily looking how people want them to look or having identification documents that don't match the person that's standing in front of them, um, or having had municipal charges for, you know, crimes just that people commit to survive. Um, theft is one of them, loitering is one of them. So I think that um, I, and I tend to be the, um, you know, I need a good neutral term for Debbie Downer because I can't really call myself that, right? I need, you You put your thinking cap on for that and then I'll, I'll give it. you credit. Thank you. But, you know, I think that we still need to, we, we can look at this and we can say this is wonderful, right? But we still need to, to look at how it's going to affect people. And you are exactly right that my boss is not going to fire me because right. I'm not only am I my own boss, but my, sp my spouse and I um, created a law firm so that we could find and, and have a place for people, honestly, like me. We focus on the LGBTQ, the lesbian, bisexual, gay, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex community in both our employment and also in the, the cases that we take. Um, it's really important to for people to be able to walk in and who they love or how they identify is is off the table. We're going to help them get divorced, get custody of their kids, deal with their kids' special education needs. And, you know, it's the same when you when you walk in and you're like, okay, this is my community. I can I can relax. I can put that guard down. Um, and that's, to be honest, it's my safe space. My work is my safe space. Guess what? I don't hire people or keep people around who don't get my pronoun right, right? I mean, it's, I've got it made. I'm going to work on it because I might want a job. So, <laughs> you know, send me your resume. I'll consider it. <laughs> well, this is great. I, I, we're going to have a program in two weeks where we're going to have some of the old G's on uh, <laughs> women and men who were gay, have been, who are in their 70s and some 80s, and they've been gay for a long time. But through their entire work career, they never came out. And they never came out because they didn't feel that it was safe to come out. Um, I remember um, when I, many, many years ago, uh, maybe about 20 years ago, every December, and I'm sure there are quite a few people watching who are chuckling as I tell this because they were a part of it. But every December, there was a very high level individual who would invite anyone who was gay um, and felt comfortable letting others know would invite us to a holiday party. It was a, and they called it a Christmas party. And I remember the first year I was invited, I was like, oh no, I'm not going to go. No, I, I, I won't even know anyone there. And I don't really want to be in the room with gay people. It's just that, you know, this is who I think I am. And so one year I said, oh, you know what? My partner and I said, let's go. And I'm going to tell you, Celeste, when we opened the door and walked in, and we saw all these people, folks I watch on TV as um, news reporters, 
people who are in the legislator, the legislature with me, people who are in cabinets. And I'm looking around the room at these 30, 40 people. I'm like, all these people are gay. And they were like, Janine, and none of us are here tonight. I'm like, oh, okay. Because nobody felt comfortable letting his or her colleagues know that he or she is gay. And it's, you know, this decision yesterday just takes care of all of that all over uh, this country. But I do know that it doesn't take care of all of it in the minds of people. Because I remember when, and I'm going to bring um, Ariel on in a second, I remember when we got uh, marriage equality and everybody thought, oh, this is terrific. And then finally people are saying, well, I wouldn't bake cakes for a same-sex wedding. Well, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't perform the ceremonies. And it just kept going on and on. So laws and these types of rulings don't change the minds and the hearts of some, but at least this is something to celebrate. All right, so I am going to bring Ariel on. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And how are you? I'm good. Tell tell us about who you are before you go into the uh, Supreme Court ruling. Oh, and sure. by the way, hello, Lisa Burke. I see both you and uh, Karen, uh, other regulars. I always like to acknowledge them. Okay. Uh, well, uh, my name is Ariel Adler. I'm a second generation Filipina. Um, I was born in California and actually spent a lot of my growing up in Canada. So coming back to the United States for school, um, there were some, some cultural shifts back uh, at the time when I was in high school, when I was um, preparing to move to the US, um, I specifically remember hearing about uh, military padres performing same-sex marriages and then to come to the US where um, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was still in place. And we were many, many years from um, the US v. Windsor and Obergefell decisions. Um, it was it was something, you know, that maybe didn't affect me in that moment as a, as a young person coming to school, but um, definitely something that was different. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now I'm uh, an attorney, uh, an associate in the Bankruptcy Financial Reorganization and Creditors Rights Group of Lowenstein Sandler. You're going to be um, very, very busy. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it, it, is, it is strange uh, in a way being in, um, in a practice that is uh, sort of inverse to the health of um, the economy generally, but um, mm -hmm. You know, me and, and so many of my colleagues really believe in um, encouraging businesses and small businesses and entrepreneurs to to take risks and 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 bring their services and, and goods to their communities. And so um, we really take seriously um, and uh, are very uh, enthusiastic and, and um, in our, 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 you know, in our work, in our in our vocations in that way. So. Um, I am, I've been at Lowenstein for almost a couple of years now. And um, although I uh, married my wife uh, before I came to the firm, um, we welcomed our son uh, just three months ago, uh, right before uh, mandatory work from home happens. So there was a lot of change in a very short period of time for us. Um, but I, I'm very grateful to be able to say that uh, Lowenstein has been um, an employer where I have felt genuine support. Uh, they're not only its inst uh, its um, institutional, I guess, DNI uh, organizations and affinity groups and initiatives and programming, but um, it has been a place where dialogue and and critical examination of how we as employees at the firm, attorneys and staff, uh, as well as, uh, you know, we as people in the broader community uh, can can do better. It's it's not um, it's not a matter of 
setting goals and hitting them, but it's, it's an ongoing dialogue. And uh, I feel like I've been the beneficiary of that in, you know, maybe one very particular way in that I um, have taken uh, a brief uh, upfront parental leave uh, that I, the only, I guess my biggest concern about taking it was, you know, how do I transition my work in a way that's responsible and, and accountable to the to the uh, colleagues and clients that I work with and for. And um, now having come back to work for a few months, albeit from home, how do I then transition to taking another larger uh, leave period? Um, and our leave policy is called parental leave. So there's, you know, there's no, um, I, I guess, strangeness or or inaccuracy of having to call it paternal leave because my wife was the one who carried our child and and delivered our child so all these all these policies and we and uh, Christian and Celeste talked about uh, adverse employment decisions such as failure to hire or or firing um, the ones that really were talked about in the uh, in the boss talk opinion uh, that was issued yesterday there are also the microaggression, um, implicit bias, uh, more, much more subtle impacts of unequal employment uh, experiences that prevent pro professionals, employees, people who are just trying to make their way in the world from being the best worker, being the best contributor to society that they can be because they have to be concerned about maybe if they are able to be out being less out or maybe having to be in the closet entirely and those kinds of uh, daily burdens that employees have to bear and still in their lived experience uh, as uh, as compared and contrasted to uh, the legal rights that have been afforded under you know, legislation and uh, co supreme court decisions um, those all add up and 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 impact employees' ability to to do the best work and to have the best experience at, at the employers, even the employers um, that that do implement uh, different initiatives to to try to improve diversity. And that's why it's a continual uh, improvement, uh, a continual introspection uh, at all levels, uh, individually and um, at the different um, employer institutions. So one of the things I'm, I'm wondering, and Celeste, I think I'm going to push this over to you right now. What I've found with laws, laws and regulations, you still have human beings who are in charge of the universe. So there are going to be some folks who are going to try to get around the fact that I didn't really fire you because you're gay. And then you go through all of these checklists of these um, make-believe issues that probably are not legitimate, that the individual has been fired, but it's really because they're gay. Tell me and the audience, how do you help a client like that? Well, you know, employment, employment discri discrimination is sort of a, a, a legal beast in and of itself. But I, what I find most interesting about this decision, um, the Bostock, Zarda, Amy Stevens decision that came out, is that the the way that the court looked at it basically said, so long as there is what's called but for causation, meaning as long as there is some that the fact that somebody is in the court's words a homosexual or a transgender. Um, and that that was a part of the reason why they were fired, then I think that you've got more of a case that you actually have a case. And so um, rather than trying to say, like, listen, you know, they were fired for they were fired for cause. And also we didn't like them because they were gay. I read this decision to say, OK, well, now you've got sorry, you have a, a, a because of sex. A Title VII violation if Title VII applies to you. Um, so I, I think that in the employment context, this is this is a great decision for um, 
employees, but I actually think this is a, a good decision for employers because I think this decision tells them, hey, we have to get our HR departments the training folks. Um, we need to have employee manuals. We need to be looking at our policies. Like, at, you know, as Ariel pointed out, we need to make sure that our um, our language is gender neutral because a lot of uh, and although the the decision doesn't ne necessarily spell this out in the way that I'm going to frame it, it's if you don't have something that is that is gender neutral that applies to all people. Um, if there's a possibility that it's differentiating an individual person based upon their sex, then you open yourself up to the possibility of litigation. So if you still have maternity leave in your policies, I would say this decision tells you you should probably get right and call it, you know, parental leave. And there are, um, you know, obviously I'm a pretty big proponent of gender neutral terms in general um, because that's where I fit, right? I, I'm not a brother or a sister, I'm sibling, a sibling. Um, and I'm not a husband or a wife, I'm a spouse. And so we, we can get to um, really including everybody and making sure we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's by having more inclusive um, language. So in sum, I think it's, I think it's good um, for folks who want to be out at work. Um, I think it does really tell employers you should probably not fire someone because they're gay, even if you want to say there's some other reason. Settle. <laughs> Don't do it and then settle. Ariel, do you want to also add to that? I, I, I think the case that you have also made, Celeste, is that consultants who are watching this now, uh, HR consultants, this is a whole new ball game for them where they now can help. I mean, and, and not just... Um, this particular ruling, but I also believe that what's going on in the world as it relates to race relations, I think it's going to spill over into other types of relations and biases that we have in society that we're going to start remaking a lot of stuff. It's going to be a blank piece of paper and we're going to get a redo of our attitudes and our behaviors toward people who are different from us. You're here. Whether it's in the workplace or whatever, I am really excited about the possibilities now that we we have a real opportunity for change. But Ariel, tell me, uh, did you want to add something to that legal conversation? Um, I think what I would add, and you, you raise a really great point, is along with the uh, awareness, the we'll say corporate side, business side awareness that employers need to have, and I think many do have, but always can improve on, of uh, the importance of training, uh, of enforcing their HR policies, of making sure that their HR professionals are prepared for these you know, very difficult, um, often extremely personal situations. And I will say that before I was a bankruptcy attorney, I was a labor and employment attorney uh, okay. on the management side as well. So uh, you know, the importance of, instilling and encouraging employers to to have the right steps in place because it it will prepare them for you know difficult situations that inevitably will occur to some degree uh having um you know dispute resolution uh, ways that employees can raise these issues i think the the bostock opinion really emphasizes that there's there's really not a lot of gray area. Um, the the textualist, and I and I saw a reference to it as progressive textualist way that Justice Gorsuch interpreted Title VII, it and the analogies that he used, uh, very real world sort of relatable analogies, hopefully relay or or deliver the the idea, the principle that there's no there's no benefit to trying to walk the margin you know your your policies should be should be the the most maybe restrictive is not the right word but the, as correct as possible and i think christian actually uh sort of alluded to it before 
many employers are multi-state employers, especially now where, you know, so much of what we do is, has converted to primarily virtual employers have had for quite some time had to tailor their policies to the most restrictive state laws uh, that did prevent or, or prescribe employment discrimination for private employers, we'll say in particular. So this uh, may actually simplify. Uh, there's no, there's now no more need to say, you know, what does New York say, but what, how will our uh, Arizona uh, management it, apply these these policies that maybe for whatever community that that employer's uh, location in, is in um, maybe isn't so congruent with their uh, mentality, you know, on an interpersonal level. There's no more need to do that kind of state by state analysis if an employer is being, um, I'll use the word conservative about having the right policies in place. So Christian, you're a member driven organization and you represent folks all over the state. And I would imagine at this point, you actually have uh, members who are outside of New Jersey. Um, our job is not done. What, tell me some of the things that are on the horizon. Yeah, we have a great deal of membership that live in Florida because as our community ages, they tend to move down there. Um, so uh, you're, you're right that we have membership um, far outside of our state. Um, we, you know, we, we have a, a, a we have a um, 150,000 member. So we hear a lot um, that happens within our state. And as Ariel was talking about, uh, it's exactly on point with the companies that we work with. A lot of companies are headquartered here in New Jersey or have their large IT operations in New Jersey and their headquarters are in, in Manhattan. Um, but yet they have offices all throughout the country, in some cases, the world. And so um, this is a conversation that happens a lot and, 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 and tailoring uh, policies based on what state those employees are working in. The nice thing though, and I think this is uh, you know what you were saying, Ariel, is that um, because they're headquartered in states like New York and New Jersey, the company policies in general were way ahead of what the state law was allowing. Um, and so uh, when when we go into companies and do corporate trainings and, and work with uh, HR on, on best practices and policy, um, we would find that the company was in line with what, we were, what we're recommending just simply based on the, the states of New York and New Jersey where they're headquartered. Um, and how they are following the laws there. Um, what, what we talked about a lot was that uh, your spouse who works for this large corporation um, may be protected at work and you may be out, but um, their, their spouse who is a public school teacher in that state has to be in the closet. And so these two loving individuals are able to live their lives out and open in their home. And then every morning when they pack their lunches and head into work, they one, one can continue that life while the other has to go back into the closet out of fear of being fired. Um, and we see, we hear about a lot of discrimination that takes place in public schools um, for educators, even here in New Jersey, but um, this has long been a stigma where, you know, educators shouldn't be LGBTQ because they are working with children. Um, and I imagine that's one of the harder professions across the, across the nation um, is for uh, teachers. We, so as I was saying, we, we see a lot of discrimination taking place in New Jersey. Just because the laws on the books doesn't mean that there aren't people, and I forget if this was Celeste or Ariel, but this is a great point, and this is the unconscious bias element of um, having an administrator, a superintendent, a principal who is um, discriminating against you, keep in moving, moving the, the goal marker um, because they don't like who you are. And look no further than how we're implementing LGBTQ inclusive curriculum. Mm -hmm. And school boards are coming out and saying, we're not going to be doing that. That's ridiculous. Right. We shouldn't be teaching children about the LGBTQ community. 
Well, imagine being an educator in a district where the superintendent or the school board is coming out on a public statement like that against the law. It's a really unsafe environment for that educator to be out. Um, and if the educators feel unsafe, then how are the students going to feel unsafe? So uh, this is this is, goes back to just visibility. Visibility is so important. There's still so much work to be done, even after this ruling, even after marriage equality. This is why we're still in schools. This is why we're still going into workplaces. This is why we're going uh, and doing a lot of trainings and work in the healthcare space. All right, I, I, I know you know this. Uh, I know everybody on this call knows this, but a lot of times you'll have an older individual in some cases who have spent their entire life fighting for the rights that we enjoy today, their spouse passes away, they move into an older adult facility, and then they go back into the closet because yeah. they're, they fear being abused. And so it doesn't matter what the law is. I mean, it's great, it does matter what the law is. It's great when it's on your side, but it doesn't change the world as soon as that ruling comes out. There's so much more work that needs to happen after ruling and, and legislation, the hearts and the minds are the harder, harder process. And, and that's why organizations like Arden State Equality exist. That's why there's so many folks in this chat that I see who commit their lives to um, changing minds and hearts. Uh, and that's the, that's the, the longer uh, road. Well, we do have a very, very long way to go still. It's kind to uh, hard to imagine that um, going through all of the different structures of relationships that New Jersey went through before they actually got to marriage equality, they finally got there. Um, but now we're seeing that all over this country, uh, the Supreme Court, the most unlikely Supreme Court would make a ruling such as this, but we've got to keep fighting the big fight. And I'd like to give some suggestions to our viewers, those of you out there. If you are an employer or if you are a boss and you're feeling a little uncomfortable, you don't want to really make some mistakes and you want to do this right, we have some guests on this program. You might want to reach out to someone. Certainly we have Garden State Equality. We have the law firm that uh, Celeste and her wife, no, can't do that law firm, no. No, you got my pronouns wrong again. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, that, no, Celeste wait, we have is their the law spouse. Firm that Celeste, Celeste and their wife, their wife, right? Or their tell spouse. me the other one. Or spouse, their there spouse. You there you go. So, so, the spouse is the part of the marriage and not a wife. See, I'm learning. It's the spouse. Yep. Okay, I, I got it now. So give the name of the law firm. It's it's Argentino Fiore Law and Advocacy. So yes. it's argentinolaw.com. And if you type the Celeste Fiore lawyer into Google, it's going to be me. Um, don't click on the person who is a civil engineer in California. You will not get legal advice from that person. There is another Celeste Fiore. And that would be their law firm. There you go. Yes. Oh my goodness. I want to, I want to, yes. I want, I want to, yes. And, and then of course we have Ariel. Now, Ariel, I do want you to just give a little bit about the section that you're leading. I think it's amazing that, uh, the New Jersey state bar does this. And I thank you for that. So I am this year's chair of the LGBT rights section of the New Jersey State Bar. Uh, our mission, uh, you know, under the umbrella or auspices as a section of the State Bar is to really promote and provide resources for the LGBTQ uh, legal community to, you know, research and analyze and make recommendations to the State Bar about pending legislation that has uh, impacts or potential impacts on the LGBTQ community to, uh, to encourage and uh, provide resources and empower LGBTQ attorneys, uh, certainly to provide a forum for our wonderful allies 
to, and many of whom do directly serve the LGBTQ community as part of their, their practices uh, and to really increase access to justice for LGBTQ members of the community uh, in New Jersey. Uh, it's, you know, it's been a wonderful, it's been wonderful being a member of the section. And I know that I for one have learned so much about, uh, about the LGBTQ community, about inclusiveness, um, and certainly during uh, these very difficult times about the importance of being an ally, the LGBTQ community has, has been so fortunate to have allies, straight allies, uh, allies um, uh, of, across the, the racial and religious spectrum, um, because our, our people who identify as LGBTQ uh, have intersectional identities as, as I do. Um, and I, I didn't specify, but I identify as bisexual in particular. But uh, now we we have to also, as we celebrate, you know, our our victories and, and extremely hard fought and the challenges and sacrifices um, and battles of those who have uh, advocated and and blazed the trail before us to be able to have a decision like like Bostock yesterday um, that we need to serve and support and and champion uh, you know racial equality in this time uh, you know are be good brothers and sisters good allies um, good colleagues to our uh, our our black colleagues and friends and family members um, and to really think of diversity and inclusion broadly because it serves everybody including uh, you know uh, diverse identities that we may not think of like um, people who have grown up in rural communities you know that's a diverse experience that we don't often talk about and how that impacts how people think or uh, people who grow up in difficult socioeconomic uh, situations that's a diverse experience that that impacts really how people interact with each other and I and I do really think and the LGBT rights section provides a great forum for these discussions that we change hearts and minds by by having these difficult discussions and and connecting with each other in these different, maybe less apparent ways. Um, and, I, and I'm very grateful and I encourage anybody who is, uh, you know, the legal professionals who may be watching uh, to, to reach out, check us out on the New Jersey State Bar uh, Association website. Thank you. I, I have to tell you, there are some programs where um, it's almost time to end it. And I'm thinking, oh good, we only have, um, Two more minutes and the program is done. I don't want this one to end. It's got to end. I know it's got to end, but this has been such a, um, it's been a very deep discussion. I think that it probably has triggered some magnificent uh, thoughts for people. Oh my goodness. I just, uh, I just had a former high school student. I'm going to embarrass him. Uh, Larry Wright has just signed on, or I guess he didn't just sign on to the show, but um, he just showed up because he made a comment. And, I, and I'm gonna tell one quick funny story about him. He ended up being one of my favorite students, although all of my students who are uh, looking right now, you're all my favorite students. But Larry, um, I taught him uh, in the 70s. And, and at the time I was only 24 and I guess he was 14, he thought he was a man. And one day I walked into the classroom, I was a high school English teacher, and uh, about 102 soaking wet, great big afro. I used to wear uh, bell-bottom jeans and platform shoes. And all the kids thought that I was their age. They didn't want me to be their teacher. And Larry picked me up and would not put me down in the middle of the class, in front of the whole class. And I said to him, if you won't put me down, at least take me to the intercom so I can call the vice principal. And he said, okay. And he took me over so I could call the vice principal. And the vice principal came in and said, you've got to come down to the office. And he was suspended for a couple of days, but he absolutely loved it. And he ended up being one of my best students. So I'm glad that he has signed on to look at this program. 
because I'm sure uh, he wasn't the happiest camper in the world when he heard that I was gay. And he got over it soon. It's been 40 years, so he gets over it. Now he's 60. But thank you, Larry, for signing on to this program today. I love you. All right. So I'm going to let you all go back to your spouses. And I thank you very much for being a part of this moment. It's been a great conversation. All of you will be coming back on again. This is Christian's second time. And I know there will be more to talk about um, on this show. Thank you so much, uh, Christian. And please give my best to your husband. Um, and I guess I will call him a him. So there. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having these conversations. Um, and what Ariel was saying, difficult conversations. You bring your viewership and the people watching in on conversations that they may not be comfortable having in their personal lives, but they can experience and learn through you. So thank you for having this platform and for highlighting LGBTQ stories and victories in the month of June. And so we have uh, Madam Ariel. Now we, I think the uh, system is messing up again. But thank you so very much for coming on, being a part of this. I have learned so much from you as well. Um, I'm going to be checking you out again, uh, especially since I know that you're with the New Jersey State Bar. I'd like to one day have you, Garden State Bar, and um, the uh, Hispanic Bar, and the uh, Association of Black Women Lawyers. I would like to have all four organizations on at the same time. I think we'll have something to really talk about as the uh, young people continue marching. I think there will be a lot to talk about. Thank you so much, Janine. And I will uh, mention as well the Asian Pacific American Lawyers Association, Apollo NJ, uh, which is um, at the APO Affinity Bar in New Jersey as well. Um, it's it's always so much good comes out of, of collaboration and discourse and, and goodness knows we need it. Thank you very much for, for mentioning them. And if you would, uh, just send me a text with the contact because I want to make sure I have everybody included. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. There she is. No. I Here said I that am. purposely. I said it purposely. Wait, hold on a second. A minute, you wait. use the wrong pronoun purposely? That's not a thing we do. <laughs> but thank you. I, I, you know, I'm just assuming that you're giving me the floor or we're having a technical difficulty, but that's okay. Um, I'll talk. Thank you so much for having um, all of us on and for me on in particular. You have been uh, a wonderful sport. Um, and I think that you, um, you were uh, warned about my my personality and my sense of humor and so i hope that i lived up to all of the wonderful things um that everyone said and you're i are not going to get rid of me no, you're not I going didn't. to get rid of me this has been an absolute <laughs> delight and i tell you who else has been an absolute delight uh marie i see marie has oh. uh signed on as well i do yeah. now marie do i say her yes she uses she her pronouns very good well I, I tell you, this has been an absolute delight. Thank you for all of the energies that you have put in personally to make this a success and um, making the connection with Ariel. Uh, that really saved me a lot of footsteps. Um, I just appreciate it. And, Absolutely. Um, Thank if you. I have someone, if I have someone in the family who has an issue, I know where to send them. Absolutely. Send them, send them to me. And if we can help, we will absolutely send them to the right person who's going to get it. Beautiful. Thank you so very much. Thank my you. best to my best to your spouse. <laughs> okay, you, you are a quick learner. You said you were and you are. I'm trying. I'm trying. Great. Thank you great. so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. So folks, another good show with LaRue List Cafe. It has been great. And let me just say to you again, if an idea comes to you, uh, an organization you're working with, a firm you're working with, a client who you think has a great product or something 
great. That meshes with my own values as well. Give me a buzz. Let's talk about this because I, this is a forum for everybody. This is not the Janine LaRue show. This is about conversations where people will come on into the cafe and do what I love to do with issues. Let's talk about it. Thank you very much. Have a magnificent night. Be safe. You may be tired of hunkering down and wearing a mask and all of that, but trust me, the virus is not tired at all. So be safe and thank you for coming in.